Good evening, and welcome to Dimensions of Prophecy with Kenneth Cox. I'm Brenda Wood. Why a church? That's a good question. I find a lot of people today who have questions about the church. They say they want to accept Christ as their savior, but don't want to belong to a church. What's the purpose of the church? Why did Christ give the church? How much authority does the church have over an individual? These are questions tonight's presentation by Pastor Cox will answer for you. Follow carefully as we take a look at what God's Word has to say about the subject of the church and the part it is to play in the lives of Christian men and women today. Let's join the Dimensions of Prophecy team with Pastor Cox as he answers the question, Why a church? After I had finished college, I went to Washington, D.C. to attend the seminary. And that's where I went to the seminary. And while I was there, one of the professors that I was taking a class from told us in class that he wanted us to go down to the downtown D.C. area and to visit five churches. He said, I want you to visit five churches, and after you have visited those five churches, then he said, I want you to pick out one of those five churches, and I want you to write me a paper about it. He said, I want you to tell me when it started, who its first pastor was. I want you to tell me about all the ministry of that church to the community, how many different buildings they've been in, how many different pastors they've had, what effect they've had on the community and all, and this kind of thing. So I went downtown and visited five different churches, and picked out one that I thought I would enjoy writing about. It was a big, beautiful church. And I began to gather all the information on this church, found out when it was started and who the pastor was that started it and all the background on the church. And I wrote up my paper on it, but I just really wasn't very happy with it when I finished the paper because I didn't have enough information on the last 10 years of that church. There just wasn't enough there to, uh, that I felt comfortable about it. So I decided I would go back down and visit the church again and talk to some of the people and see if I could get some more information about the church for the last 10 years. And I went down that particular day to attend church and to talk to the people. The building is a very, very beautiful building. It has gorgeous stained glass windows in it just lovely and I can remember when I walked in there and the I was met at the door by the ushers deacons they were dressed in tuxedos had a boutonniere in their lapel had some church bulletins in their hand and when you came in the door they nodded to you and they ushered you down the aisle and showed you your seat and this particular Usher or deacon handed me the church program and said he hoped that I enjoyed the program. And I sat there and just looked at the church, and it was just absolutely gorgeous. Enjoyed it, and it wasn't very long until the organist came out and took his seat behind the organ and began to play, and the moment he touched those keys, you could tell this was not a man that played once a week. I mean, he was accomplished. I mean, that pipe organ just filled that whole church and just seemed at times the whole church would move and it just run chills up your spine. It was fabulous as I sat there and listened to him play. And after he had played for a little bit, then the choir began to come in and they began to line up. The choir loft there. And then pretty soon the choir director came in and that choir began to sing and the moment they began to sing, you could also tell they didn't practice once a week. I mean, that choir had it together. And the songs they sang just was beautiful, lifted your soul as you listened to them sing. And after they sang a couple numbers, the pastor made his way behind the pulpit and then he began to preach. And you also could tell that he knew what he was talking about. He was articulate. His message had been thought through. It was logical. He presented it wonderful. And I sat there and I enjoyed the service and all of its details. Just enjoyed it completely. 
After the service was over, the ushers came down and ushered us out. And as I got out into the foyer of the church, well, I just stepped off to the side there and uh, waited for everybody to get out. And pretty soon one of these deacons stepped up to me and said, can I help you? And I said, I think you can. And I told him my name and told him I was a seminary student. Told him about the assignment that I had been given and that I had written a paper on, on his church. And I shared with him some of the history of the church and all about it so that he knew that I wasn't just, you know, trying to do something. He understood I was serious, and we had a real nice visit. And I said, but what I need to know, I need to know something about the last 10 years on the church here. And I said, uh, how many people has the ministry of this church brought to Christ in the last 10 years? He hung his head. And in a little bit, he looked at me and he said, there hasn't been one soul brought to Christ by the ministry of this church in the last 10 years. Now, friends, let me tell you something. You can have a beautiful church, gorgeous stained glass windows, tremendous organ that just fills the whole church and moves your soul. The choir can sing like angels. The preacher can preach. But if that church is not bringing men and women to Jesus Christ, it doesn't have any reason to exist. I can tell you right now, we have enough social clubs in this country without making churches social clubs. Church was brought into existence by God for a definite purpose. And God gave it a purpose, and if that church is not fulfilling that purpose, then it doesn't have a reason to exist. If all the people are doing is just simply come to the church and sitting in the pew and just doing that and not doing anything else, if you're not reaching out for your men and women and leading them to Christ, then, dear friend, you're not doing what God called you to do. Some people say, but Brother Cox... Uh, you know, do I need to belong to a church? Do I have to belong to a church to be saved? Uh, what's the purpose of the church? How much authority does the church have over me? Well, tonight we're going to look at the subject of the church, see what the Scripture has to say about it. Christ spoke these words. He said, I am the good shepherd, and I know my what? sheep and am known by my own. So he said, I'm the good shepherd and I know my, what? Sheep. And I want to get something clear about sheep because I find a lot of people don't understand about sheep. You see, God has sheep of all shades. You understand that? Some people get it in their head that the only kind of sheep he's got is white. Well, you're sadly mistaken. He's got sheep of all shades. And among those sheep are some old Henri ewes and some old budding rams, but they're his sheep. Are you clear? He said, I have these. These are my sheep. And he said, my sheep know me. Now listen very carefully because you're going to have to get something real clear here. The next verse. And other sheep I have which are not of this what? Full. Okay. God said, other sheep I have that are not of this full. Understand, get it clear in your thinking that God has sheep in all folds. God has sheep in all churches. They're his. They're his sheep. And he said, I know them and my sheep know me. But let's continue on. Them also I must what? Bring, and they will what? Hear my voice, and there will be one flock or one foal and one shepherd. Now God says, I have sheep in all folds. So he's got lots of sheep different places. But let me ask you, how many foals does he have? Huh? One foal. 
get it clear. I run on to people that want to think that you belong to anything. No, you can't. He said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. They're his sheep, sheep, but he said, them also I must what? Bring. There will be one fold and one shepherd. Understand that. Dear friend, I told you when we started that you do not find truth by a church. I don't care what church it is. You don't find truth by a church. Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, Seventh-day Adventist, you don't find truth by a church. You find truth by the Word of God. Get it clear. You find truth here. That's where you find truth. But the reverse of what I have said is true. You don't find truth by a church, but you find the church by the truth. You get in the book, you find out what that book says, and when you know what that book says, you better believe you'll know what you ought to do. That's clear. That's why he says there's one foal. He said, I've got a lot of sheep out here. You see, if you're his sheep, he's going to tell you something about it. Listen. says there will be one foe, one flock. All right, here we go. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they what? Follow me. Now, he says, my sheep hear my voice. Okay, they know him. All right, they hear my voice. I know them, and they follow. I run on some people that have a rough time with that. You know, they're, they find out what the Scripture says. They understand what it says. There is no question in their mind what it says, and yet they don't want to follow. Dear friend, when God says, this is the way, walk ye in it, you better follow. That's what he's saying. He said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. And he said, I will bring them there will be one foe, there will be one shepherd. Oh, I run on people say, oh, Brother Cox, I want to accept the Lord. I want to give my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to follow him, but I don't want to belong to a church. I just want to belong to a great ethereal body of the Lord. I don't want to belong to a congregation. I don't want to put my name on a row. I don't want to belong to that. Dear friend, let me tell you something. The Scripture doesn't know any such thing. When the Scripture talks about a church, it's talking about a church in a locality, a particular group of people, and God says you and I ought to belong to it. This idea of saying, oh, I just want to belong to the body of Christ. I don't want to belong to a local congregation. The Bible doesn't tell you that. I want to share some Scripture with you about it. Jesus gave a commission. He said, therefore, go and make what? Come on. Disciples. Give me another word for that. Followers. That's what it means. Go out here and make followers of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. God said that you and I are to go out here, and by the way, get it clear, dear friends, the call to spread the message wasn't just given to the clergy. That call's given to you. And it says that we're to go out and we're to make disciples and we're to teach them what God's Word says. They're to follow. They're to walk with Him. This becomes God's church. All right, it says, And so the churches were strengthened in the faith, and increased in number what? Daily. Daily, all right. Now, he's talking about here going out and preaching the Word, and it says the churches were increased in faith, and they increased in number how often? Daily. Now, that's not talking about a great ethereal body. That's talking about a group of people in a local place. Let's look at another one. I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in... Centuria. You see what I'm saying? 
In other words, when God's talking about his church, he's talking about a group of people in a particular place. And he said, I'm talking about Phoebe. She's a sister, and she belongs to the church that's in Centuria. That's God's church. That was God's church in that particular place. You see, he's given a commission. He's told people there to spread the gospel, there to take the gospel. You can't not belong to anything and do anything, dear friend. You can't do that. And that's why he's talking about this particular place. It also says here, the churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. That's God's church. They met in the home of Priscilla and Aquila. They met in this home. There wasn't a building there. They met in that home, and God said, listen, that's my church. So what I'm trying to tell you tonight, dear friends, is when God says that you and I are to belong to a church, he talks about the churches increasing daily, he's talking about a local congregation in a particular place, and he's saying that you and I ought to belong to it. That's what he's saying. And when they had come together, excuse me, and when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and how he had opened the doors of faith to the Gentiles. Now, when it says that he had gathered the church together, what does it mean? Hmm? Well, it meant he had gathered all the believers, all the people together. That's what makes a church. This building doesn't make a church. If you're not here and it's just a building, it ceases to be a church. You're what makes a church. That's what it's saying. They gathered the church together. That meant the believers, the followers of the Lord. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. They went to these different cities, Paul, Silas, Luke. They went in and preached. Men and women accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, and what do you think they did with them? Said bye. Huh? No, they organized them. They made a church out of them. They got them in a particular place, and they made a group of people out of them in that place. And when it says they went to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, those were places where they had already been. They had preached the gospel. They had organized a church there, and now they were going back to encourage them. That's what they're doing. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. They were going back. They were sharing with them what they had done in other places, and they were telling them, this is what we need to do. Be faithful. Encourage them to continue on. That's what it's talking about. And when they had appointed what? See, how do you appoint elders in an inferior body that nobody belongs to? You can't appoint elders to that. You've got to have elders in a group. They got these people. These people accepted the Lord, and they organized them, and they ordained elders, and they ordained deacons, and they set up the whole church organization in that particular city. And that's why when Paul got away, he's writing letters to Corinth and he's writing letters to Galatia and he's writing letters to Ephesus. He's writing to those churches that they organized. When they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They were there and they preached Christ to these people and these people accepted the Lord and they organized a church there. So I hope that tonight, you're understanding that when God talks about a church, he's talking about local congregations, and he's telling you and I that we ought to belong to them. That's what he's saying. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being what? Saved. No, the church is not going to save you. That's not the purpose of the church. Jesus Christ saved you, but you ought to belong to the church. It says he added to the church those that were being what? Saved. That's what he's saying. Now, 
I have folks a lot of times ask me, Brother Cox, what am I supposed to do? You know, I've heard this. What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to handle this? Well, if there was only two scriptures in the Bible to give you, to tell you what you ought to do, it would be these two. And this is what it says. For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which also effectively works in you who believe. Now, it says they went in there, they preached the word of God, and the people accepted it what? Huh? Oh, it says they accepted it not as the word of men, but as it was the word of God. Now, I have had passed out to you every night that you've gone out here, I've had passed out to you an outline. And I've told you, go home and read it, study it. See if it's what God's Word says. I can tell you one thing without any hesitation, without any reservations whatsoever. I can stand before the Lord Jesus Christ without the slightest hesitation and tell you and tell him that I have preached to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've done that. I have no hesitation about that. Now, if it's the Word of God, and if you've found it to be the Word of God, this is what it says you're to do with it. For you, brethren, became imitators or followers of the what? Churches of God which are in Judea. In other words, they heard the message. They listened to Paul, and they understood it, and they became part of the churches. In other words, they organized a church in Thessalonica and they became followers of the Lord. That's what you're to do. You're to become part of God's church. Makes that absolutely clear. It says here in 2 Corinthians 8 and 18, we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. Now, here was a man that was known by a number of the churches. It says that his praise, evidently he's a very good man, evidently he's a, a good Christian, evidently he's a strong worker for the Lord, he's highly thought of by the churches. Listen to what it says here. And not only that, but who was also chosen by the what? Churches to travel with us with this gift which is administered by us to the glory of of the same Lord and the declaration of your ready mind. What's it saying? Well, what they're saying is that Paul and Silas needed some help. They needed some help, and so the churches, not one church, the churches got together and they said, listen, Paul and Silas need some help. And they said, let's send this brother with them. And so the churches chose this brother to go with them. Now, you don't do that without organization. You don't do that without the churches coming together and working together. That's what they're supposed to be. It's the belief in God's Word that binds them together. And as those churches work together, dear friends, they can go out and take the gospel to the world. That's what it's for. We have an obligation. This church... This church has two obligations. Get it clear. This church has the obligation of taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to this community. That is this church's responsibility. And if you're not doing that, then you are not doing what you're supposed to do. Your second responsibility is to help take the gospel to the world. If you're, helped, if you're helping to take the gospel to the world and you're ignoring your responsibility to this community, you're not doing what you ought to do. If you're taking it to this community and you're not help taking it to the world, you are ignoring what you should be doing. You have both those responsibilities. I read about a church that was very wealthy. 
they didn't do anything as far as helping take the gospel of the world. They just spent all the money on themselves. You know, there's some churches that are that way. That's all they they can't see any farther than the end of their nose. And so they, they don't have any commission of taking the gospel of the world. And this church spent all of its money on itself. And uh, they had some money in the treasury that was just continuing to build up that had been given to them. And they were trying to decide what to do with it. So they decided that they would have a picture painted, that they would commission an artist to paint a picture of a dying church. They figured if they could have an artist paint a picture of a dying church and put it out in the hall that uh, as the members saw it, well, that way they would look at it and it would help them make sure that their church never got in that condition. And so they hired this artist and told him that they wanted a picture of a dying church. And he took the commission to paint the picture for them and went off. And after a number of months, he notified them that he had the painting done and that he would be bringing it back. And they set a date for him to bring it. They called all the church members together and they had the artist come. And there at the service, he was going to unveil the painting. In their minds, they knew what the picture looked like. They could see a church that was run down. Some of the windows broken out. The doors hanging sideways on the hinges. Uh, dirty, ill-kept. They, they had all the ideas of a church that was in a very, very bad condition. But when the artist took the veil off the painting, there was a very beautiful church. Didn't have a broke window anywhere. The doors were all on the hinges. It was clean. It was neat. Everything was beautiful about the church, and the church members couldn't believe what they were seeing. And as they looked very carefully over in the corner, they saw an offering box that said, World Missions. A spider had come and had woven its web over the slot where you dropped your offering. That's all it takes for a church to die. It's all it takes. It's when you and I lose what God has given us about taking the gospel of the world, then, dear friends, we're missing what God called us to do. The church is a place where members are to come together and their responsibility is to worship God and to take the message that they have as living witnesses of what Jesus Christ has done in their lives and to share that with men and women. That's what they're called to do. Now, the church is also more than that. It says here in Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church. Who is the head? That word he is what? capitalized. It's saying that Jesus Christ is the head of the body, which is the what? The church. All right. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So it says that Jesus is the head of the church. Now watch carefully because Paul is going to begin to make an application that if you're not careful, you'll miss. Now you are the what? Body of Christ. Okay, who's the head? Jesus Christ. Who is the body? We are. Okay, you, now you are the body of Christ and members individually, okay? For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So it says Christ is the head, it says the church is the body, and it says that you and I are members individually. And it talks about these members. Listen. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many members. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Just because the foot said, listen, I would much rather been the hand, does that mean it's not part of the body? Huh? No. 
The foot is just as much part of the body as the hand is. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? No. No, he says very clearly here that the eye, the ear, and the eye are both part of the body. They're all part of the body of Christ. All right. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them in the body as it has pleased him. I do not care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. You have a purpose and a place in the body of Jesus Christ. Every one of you do. You have a place to fill that nobody else can fill. Only you. You are special. You're not like any other individual in the world. Therefore, God has placed you in the body as it has pleased Him. There's some of you here tonight that God has a purpose and a place for you in this church. And he's calling you and telling you you belong here. That's what he's saying. We all are members of the body of Christ. Members individually. And if, we're, and if there were all one member, where would the body be? And now there are many members, yet... One body. You know, it bothers me. I don't understand some people's thinking. I don't understand how they treat one another. They're members of the same body. And I hear them saying if some other member is good enough for them. They shouldn't do that. Next time they'll know better. And I wonder, what? Am I hearing right? Is that the way the members of my body treat me? Huh? You know, let's say that I, you know, I eat more candy than I ought to. You know? And so let's say that I'm awakened about 3 o'clock in the morning with a toothache. I mean, it's really hurting. And I decide that I'm going to get up and go into the bathroom and get me an aspirin out of the medicine cabinet and put it up beside that tooth to see if it'll give me some relief until I can go to the dentist the next day. And so I get up out of bed and I go into the bathroom and I go to open the medicine cabinet and my hands won't move. I just can't get them up. They just won't move. They're right there and pretty soon they say, good enough for you. Shouldn't have eaten so much candy. You know better. Next time you won't do that. Is that the way my hands treat my tooth? No, my hands sympathize with my tooth. We belong to the same body, friends. Not, not my place as a member of the body to be criticizing the other member. I'm to be sympathetic. I'm to help them. That's what I'm supposed to be. You know, we have a song we sing. It goes something like this. You may notice that we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and these folks are so dear. If one has a heartache, we all shed the tear and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. You see, that's what we're to be. We're family. We're all part of the same body. That's what the church is to be. The church is a place that is to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to men and women, but it's also a place 
where we meet together and we fellowship together and we put our arms around one another and we help one another and we're part of the body of the Lord. That's what the church is to be. That's what God called it to be, dear friends. In fact, the scripture says that the church is the apple of God's eye. You want to anger the Lord, do something to the church. Now you remember it's his bride. If you want to anger him, that's the way to anger him. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the what? Church and gave himself for it. The church is the apple of his eye. It's concerned about the church. Looks after it. Cares for it. It's his bride. It also says that he presents his church how? Do you know how he presents his church? Huh? Yes, it says he presents his church without spot or wrinkle. Now, you women here tonight, particularly all you wives, stick your fingers in your ears. I'm going to tell the husband something. Y'all don't need to hear it. I'm going to tell you men how to love your wives. Okay? If you can convince her that she doesn't have spot or wrinkle, I'll guarantee you she'll love you from now on. Okay? And it says that's the way God presents his church, as without spot or wrinkle. His church loves it, cares for it. Now, it's the church right down here at the end, the end of time. And it says here in Revelation, and the dragon which we found out last night was the devil was angry with the woman, which is the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It says that the old devil is mad at the church right down at the end of time. Sure, churches have problems. No question about that. Sure, there's people in churches that do wrong things. Sure, they do. But God help them. That's where they ought to be is in church. What's wrong with us when we think because they do something wrong, they ought to be out of the church? They need to be in the church. They need to be loved. They need to have your arms around them and caring for them and love them. That's what needs to be going on. It's a church there that God has called to help men and women. That's what it's for. The devil's mad at the church. He's going to do anything he can to anybody. He doesn't want you in the church. He wants you out of it. That's the last place he wants you is in the church. And you can find all, a lot of reasons. I find a lot of people all the time saying, oh, too many hypocrites in the church. Well, dear friend, let me tell you something. You shouldn't be stumbling over the hypocrites. That's where they ought to be, is in church. Maybe they'll find the Lord. Stop being hypocrites. If you're staying out of the church because some people in the church are doing wrong, then you're not doing right. You need to believe, be in the church. You need to be part of the church. Sure, the devil's mad at it. He's going to do everything he can to do away with it, to blot it out if he could. So don't expect it not to have troubles. Get away from this idea that the church is to be an old folks' home for saints. That's not the church. I wish we'd get away from that idea. The church is a hospital for sinners. That's what it's for. And that's what God called it to be. Back years ago in the 1600s in England, a king had come to the throne who decided that he was going to do away with religious liberty and that he was going to forbid any church other than the excuse me other than the state church to exist i mean he was just going to say none of them could exist except that one he sent out letters sent out proclamations across all of england saying every church that was there had to be disbanded 
If they didn't disband, he would send out his army. He would disband the church. He would nail up the doors and the windows and forbid the people to worship there. Outside of London stood a little church. They received, notice, sent his army down, and they ran the people out of the church, and they boarded the church up, forbid the people to worship there. Living next door to the church was a man by the name of Robert Shirley. And Robert Shirley watched as that little church began to fall apart. As the years passed, he saw how some of the children had thrown rocks through the windows, how someone had broken in, and how the church was beginning to just disintegrate, fall apart. And the more he watched that, the more conviction grew in his heart to do something. And finally, not able to stand it any longer, he went over and went inside the church and he began to clean it up, swept the church out, mopped the floors, cleaned up the inside, rebuilt the pews, rebuilt the pulpit, painted the church inside, put all the windows back in. And when he got all that done, he went outside and he redid the whole outside of the church and painted it and made the church look brand new. Went around and invited the people in the community to come and worship. And they did. And the king heard about it. Sent his army down and arrested Robert Shirley. He was tried in London. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in the tower at London where he spent his entire life. That little church still stands today. If you go there, there's a plaque on the door. And on the door, the little plaque says this. It says, in the year of 1651, when everything throughout the land was either demolished or profaned, I, Sir Robert Shirley, do dedicate this church to God whose singular praise it is to have done the best things in the worst times to you, to me, who are living today, living in a time in which the devil is mad at the church, a time in which he's pouring out all of his wrath. I hope it can be said of every one of you here tonight that you did the best thing in the worst times, God is asking you to be part of his body, to follow him, to walk with him. I want you to listen as Steve sings, Blessed be the tide that binds. Tomorrow night, the meeting begins at what time? 6.45. I'm going to be preaching about a financial secret that most of the world doesn't know. I'm going to be preaching about money. That's what I'm going to preach about. And I want to put you at ease right now. I'm not going to be making an appeal for an offering. Okay? That's not what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be preaching about money. In fact, Jesus said more about finance than any other singular thing. So it's extremely important. I'm going to share some things with you tomorrow night you don't want to miss about finances. So we hope that you'll be here for that subject. And then after that, when the second service is the coming of Elijah, the last, listen, the last two verses of the Old Testament read this way. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. When is Elijah coming back? Why did God single out that man? What's his message? Why is it to help us prepare for the coming of the Lord? That's what we're going to be looking at tomorrow night. So. Both those subjects are important. So we hope that you'll be sure and be back with us then again tomorrow night. Thank you very much. Let me have prayer with you and we'll let you go. Heavenly Father, we thank thee so much 
that we can be part of your body, that we can be members individually, that we can have a ministry to help others learn of the marvelous grace of our Lord and Savior. Bless each one here as they go to their homes, watch over and care for them. Save us all in thy kingdom, not because we're worthy, but because we have accepted thee. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Good night. God bless each of you.